Clara Peters, A Reflection of Self and Society. Now known as a master painter, Clara Peters created an array of work consisting mainly of highly realistic still lifes. Completed in 1611, this work, Still Life, depicts various items, gilded goblets, baked goods, and a very detailed floral arrangement. The trays filled with meats, pastries, and flowers overflow in a show of abundance onto the wooden table. Each item is intricately detailed with the textures of every surface represented realistically. In this work, Peters not only showcases an array of technical skill, but also emphasizes her own identity through a self-portrait in the picture's reflection. Many artists at the time used still lifes as active participants in their newly consumerist society, but Clara Peters took her work a step farther. This podcast will argue that Clara Peters not only used the still life as a way to investigate the rise of consumerism, but as a manner of self-expression in the only way allotted to female artists of the time. In order to fully understand Clara Peters' impact as an artist, we must first have a basic understanding of the Dutch art market. Dr. Klarja Rasterhoff's book, In Painting and Publishing as Cultural Industries, leads us on a thorough investigation of Dutch society. Rasterhoff explains that the Dutch Revolt of the late 1500s served as a catalyst for art making as the economy began to flourish and the demand for exotic and luxurious products grew. As the Dutch Revolt ends and the Dutch Golden Age begins, we see a rise in the number of local artists and an influx of immigrant artists who now operate in small art centers and cities. While many artists were hard at work, not all were highly esteemed. Rasterhoff makes a distinction between decorative painters and master artists, claiming that the number of working creators was so high due to the array of work being created. Until the 1590s, portraiture was the main genre of prominent painters, but with the arrival of new immigrant painters, new genres began to come to the forefront. The Dutch were introduced to landscapes, genre paintings, and still lifes as high quality art. So what was the purpose of a still life? Still lifes at the time were a way to show what you owned. By owning a physical representation of an item, you became an owner of it. As Dr. Mia Tokumitsu states in her article, The Currencies of Naturalism and Dutch Pronk Still Life Painting, these still lives are direct communications of commercial luxury objects as products of human labor and as signifiers of worldly affluence. The naturalism that defines these still lifes in terms of reality serves to prove the existence of these objects in reference to the painting owner. In other words, because they are so intricately crafted and referenced, it served as direct proof that the painting owner must be able to directly observe these objects, a privilege afforded mainly to the elite. In Peter's piece, we can observe how the table is very close to the viewer, inviting the viewer into the picture plane. The petals of the flowers have moments of color reflection and transparency, while the metallic goblets and pitchers shine and reflect their surroundings. The appearance of each object feels so true that with the combination of hours spent and materials used, as well as the objects depicted, the painting itself becomes more desirable and luxurious than the object. Many artists, both male and female, were taking advantage of the rise of the still life as a new popular subject matter as it allowed for potential gain in both a financial sense and in notoriety. It is important to note, however, that women painters were not held to the same regards as their male contemporaries. While both men and women painted, women were considered amateurs. Women were not expected to work, and therefore the expense of professional training for an art-based career could not be afforded. Dr. Alice Elizabeth Honig, the author of The Art of Being Artistic, explains that many notable female artists were mainly the daughters of painters who were allowed to make art to help the family business, but would more than likely be expected to give up painting when they married. Honig brings up the argument that female artists may have been able to hone their craft much more as their work was driven by the desire to create rather than professional requirement. There were, however, quite a few women artists who were able to begin blurring those boundaries. As Honig puts it, some women were able to blend the ideals of feminine amateurism and practical masculine commercialism involved in painting. Female artists like Jacina Terborsch, Joanna Curtin, and Katharina Backer are all mentioned by Honig as artists who expressed deep interest in their work and were able to find success in their low genres of still life and flower painting. There was room for success as a female artist, but only within the parameters of their social sphere. Clara Peters began to push the limits of her low genre of women's still life painting by imposing her own image. In our specific still life, we can see the faint reflection of her figure in the pewter pitcher and in the goblet. 
In each reflection, she is seated next to a window in what seems to be a dress and headdress of some sort. She's reflected nearly four times, both upright and upside down in the body of the pitcher, with another partial reflection around the base of the pitcher and once in the middle of the goblet, which is slightly less noticeable. The repetition of her image is emphatic and adds to her sense of agency over her work. Reflected self-portraits are not a new concept. Jan van Eyck is another prominent painter who used this technique. But why are these specific reflections so intriguing? Dr. Martha Moffat Peacock, the author of Mirrors of Skill and Renown, explains that these reflections served not only as another aspect of realism, but also as a statement of her identity as the artist. Peacock brings another piece into question, Peter's Vanitas, which includes a depiction of a woman that some historians assume to be Peter's herself, as well as luxurious items, jewelry, gold coins, intricate trays, and goblets. Peacock refutes the concept of this painting as a true self-portrait, referencing the many minuscule self-portraits that Peters managed to work into her previous paintings, claiming the differences in appearance are too varied. If Peacock's claim is true, it can then be asserted that the Vanitas portrait is perhaps a further exploration of her skill and potential commentary on the frivolous items and activities presented to women as desirable. Unfortunately, Peacock did not specifically address the still life in question, though I believe it could only add to the argument of Clara Peters' agency within her work. While I agree with Peacock's argument that Clara Peters' Vanitas was more than just a potential self-portrait, I argue that this still life is just as integral to Peters' portrayal of identity. Over and over again, Peters places her portrait in small reflections as indications of herself. Peters was not only painting a still life for the sake of it, she was inserting herself into the language of her work. To quote Peacock, she rejected traditional notions equating women with vain, self-beautifying mirror-gazing and instead displayed her manly artistic skills. Even when disregarding the implications of identification and ownership through the reflected self-portraits, there is still much to glean from Peters' piece. Gillian Riley, author of Eat Your Words and Gastronomic Researcher, asserts that each object in Peter's still lifes had the ability to be interpreted as more than just a show of affluence. Perhaps her work was a commentary on temptation and gluttony, showcasing the plethora of rich foods available for the viewer's indulgence. There's a potential for a morality message or religious ties in the depiction of the wine as a reference to Christ's blood, the rosemary as a symbol for remembrance, and the bread as his body. While these are all viable claims for Peter's works, there are other arguments for the proposed meaning. Honig, in her piece Making Sense of Things, takes the time to explain that Dutch still lifes were often ways to show collections, specifically in the juxtaposition of familiar objects in tandem with the more exotic. The ability to purchase exciting new goods from far off lands sparked a desire to acquire and collect. If we relate this concept of acquisition to the idea of the Wunderkammer, described by Dr. Honig as the chambers of rarity being formed at this time, we can see this innate curiosity about the world being expressed in a different form. The Wunderkammer would exist as a collection of rare items, often from abroad and usually systematically placed in some effort of categorization. Honig reminds us that the categorization of knowledge featured in the Wunderkammer is not featured in the same way in Dutch still lives. While categorization is an important part of the Renaissance, it is not the main focus in Dutch still lives such as Clara Peters. Placing the unfamiliar with the familiar now becomes an opportunity for new connections to be made between objects and a sense of novelty for each still life begins to form. Each painting is a unique amalgamation of objects that when placed together can create an interesting dialogue. In our still life specifically, we are presented with many objects that easily portray the rise of consumerism in Dutch society through their origins. While some objects, like the pretzels, could potentially come from the Antwerp or Amsterdam area in which we presume Clara Peters resided, they are placed next to objects that could not physically exist in the Dutch area. The red wine would be an imported good, along with the almonds, as the Dutch climate would not be conducive to their cultivation. The flowers themselves are lush and full of potential meanings, as the poppy, presented here on the far left, is often a representation of death, and the Star of Bethlehem, presented at the base of the flower vase, has automatic ties to Christianity. But perhaps the tulip represents the most compelling argument for direct ties to Dutch society. At this time, tulips were a rising phenomenon and the basis for what became a network of tulip trading, breeding, and gambling. 
Dr. Anne Goldgar explains in her piece, The Poland Birch's Garden, that this tulip mania arose in the early to mid-1600s as a system of trading and bartering in exchange for tulip bulbs. Each tulip could vary in value due to its coloration, and trends for certain colors came and went quickly, as rare genetic mutations within the plant were highly sought after. Goldgar informs us that the Dutch tulip trade was bustling, but it was a risk, as those who purchased tulips would not know the value of their bulbs until they bloomed. When we examine the tulip in Clara Peter's still life, it seems to stand out. It's bright red, and it leans out of the flower vase and over the tray of almonds, figs. Its crimson color is a standout, and if you look at the base of the flower, we can potentially see a mutation in its coloration from red to yellow. While there is no way to confirm this tulip specifically as commentary on the Dutch tulip market, it's not outlandish to see connections between the items presented and the society that they came from. While there is little archival information about Clara Peters, we have enough information to know her work was highly influential as a contribution to painting. Dr. Courtney Barco, author of Rediscovering Female Voice and Authority, confidently credits her as a direct and significant influence to the development of Northern Renaissance still life painting. When we begin to examine Clara Peters' still life in a more analytical way, we can see the direct effect of the society and culture that surrounded her and her repetitive and emphatic assertion of her ownership through self-portraits as the painter of this piece. Clara Peters was clever. She structured her composition to have a strong sense of movement and focus, with the extended flowers circling down into the pitcher spout, around the tray of almonds and treats, and right back up again. It's cyclical and strong, repetitive and well-constructed. Each item on the table directly interacts with another object, obstructing views, reaching towards each other, barely touching. The composition is dynamic and intricate, with a great deal of thought and care. It's easy to discount this piece as just another banquet piece or still life, but that would discredit the effort and attention it was given. Clara Peters was actively investigating society and her role within it, taking control of her voice as an artist and repeatedly reminding us of her presence. As viewers, we should acknowledge her agency and understand this piece as a reflection of not only society, but also as a direct reference to the artist herself.